All right. Welcome to episode 12 of the Jake Blanchard podcast. Uh, I am beyond excited for my next guest. Uh, he's known across the internet far, far and wide uh, as the rapping dad. Uh, his name's Derek Clark. He's the author of seven books. He's a speaker. He's a musician. Uh, and he's a guy that's been on an inspiring journey against great odds in his life. Uh, he finds himself motivating people, especially young people, uh, to stay positive, overcome challenging circumstances. His social media has over 300 million views. Uh, it's fun. It's uplifting. It's entertaining. Derek Clark, the rapping dad. Uh, thanks for being on the podcast, man. What's going on, Jake? <laughs> Dude, it's so good to see you again. Wonderful. We both live pretty close to each other, which is great too. So, you know. We do. If it wasn't man. for the COVID, we could have done it live. <laughs> I know. I, uh, I love how many guitars you've got behind oh, you, you. Uh, in there. That's a pretty impressive room. I love, I love yeah, it. That, that's my new baby right there. Oh, very yeah, nice. What do you Gretsch, got back like there? Vintage. Yeah, a little Gretsch vintage. Oof. I've got, uh, you know, Telecaster right there. That's actually signed by, uh, you, you remember Hootie and the Blowfish? Yeah. Darius Rucker? Yeah. Oh. They got to hang out with me. I got to hang out with them and bam, they signed that. So yeah, and yeah. obviously the two patriotic guitars because I had a lot of success with my song Goodnight Soldier for, you know, sharing a wonderful tribute to the military. Absolutely, man. Well, yeah. I am excited for this podcast. Um, we're going to get into the rapping dad stuff uh, here right. in a little bit, because I definitely one of the things I wanted to, uh, to talk to you about, about your journey and evolution uh, and, and building that uh, out. Uh, but first, like, let's start from the beginning. Like, like who's Derek? And like, how, how did you get on this journey of, of being so inspiring and pouring into other people uh, about your experiences and your journey and healing your wounds through life? Well, who is Derek Clark? That's the question, right? So Clark is a nobody. And I'll give you a little detail about that. My mom changed my last name on the birth certificate so that my dad wouldn't find me and kill me. Because how I came in this world is a freaking crazy story. My mom had been like sexually abused by men in her past and lots of bad things had happened to her and she got pregnant. And when she told this man who forced himself on her that I'm pregnant with your kid, he says, you better go get an abortion. If you don't get an abortion, I'll kill the kid myself. So at three months, no abortion, six months, no abortion, seven months pregnant. My mom is waitressing at a restaurant in San Diego, California, doing her job, waiting tables and at seven months, man, you have a nice bump there. And I'm enjoying myself, swimming in the amniotic fluid and the warmth of my mother's womb. I try to think positive because it's about sure. to get crazy. You know what I'm saying? And my six foot four dad comes into that restaurant tables and in a fit of rage, because she didn't get an abortion, he grabbed her by her long blonde hair, whip lashed her head to the floor, dragged her back into the kitchen and continued to stomp on her stomach over and over and over again to abort me. But I lived. Wow. I lived. And so my dad went to prison. My mom got back with him when he got out of prison. When I met my mom, my biological mom, 25 years later after they abandoned me, I asked her, why would you ever get back with this man? And she says, Derek, that's what I thought love was. And I never understood that until I started working on my compassion muscle and my empathy muscle. Cause I'm like, you should have protected your son. You should have protected your son, blah, 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 blah. And, but you know, my mom, once I started working on my own compassion and empathy for others, right. It wasn't about just me, selfish, selfish, selfish. Sometimes you got to be selfless and get outside of yourself to give yourself hope. And so when I was looking at her and evaluating her life, you know, she was one of six kids that, grew up very poor in a two bedroom home. And um, she ran away at 14 because of all the abuse going on in the home. She dropped out of high school in ninth grade. And what do you think she did? She went from abusive relationship to abusive relationship. And I can understand that now because the first five years of my life, the most formidable for any, any child, but was full of brutal child abuse, brutal. I mean, I'm talking about my arm ripped off from my shoulder. I'm talking about burns where it was, I was just burned massively with, with hot water. I'm, I'm talking about drowning me in the toilet, like lots of things those first five years that I went through. I got story after story. And um, 
And so I thought that's what love was, Jake. I, I thought love was you give me attention by abusing me. That's how I get my attention. You abuse me. And so when I would go into foster homes, because I was abandoned at age five into a psychiatric facility. And then from there, I had all these diagnoses and labels. And then they transferred me for a, a, to a shelter for unadoptable kids. And it was in a building behind Juvie in, right outside Oakland, California. And so I had all these labels, all these diagnoses. And I thought love was you give me that attention by needing to hurt me and abuse me. And it would take years for me to kind of overcome that through these foster homes. But I got to tell you, it was a survival technique. I had lots of survival techniques that as a kid and as a teenager, it helps you uh, maintain your world of somewhat. It's chaos though. But when you're an adult, you realize that those techniques that you used to survive were not healthy as an adult and sure. are not healthy as a father, are not healthy as a mar in a marriage or with a partner. And so I had to learn how to shift my mindset, shift my thinking uh, and look at my life differently. I used to think of my life as a curse and now I look at it as a blessing because I'm so strong. You know, Dr. Wayne Dyer, who was I, one of my book mentors basically, he said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so when I looked at my life for years, I thought it was just a curse, hated by everything, hated by God, hated by this, this, that, you know, all these things, this resentment, this gr these grudges, this bitterness. And I learned to transform myself from being better and not bitter and letting go and grow and not letting a weakness destroy my greatness or not letting my parents' mistakes define me or confine me, you know what I mean? But let them refine me. So you know, that's how I came into this world. And I went through the foster care system for 13 years and lost a lot, man. Let me tell you, Jake, I lost my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, my grandparents, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my bedroom, my toys, my self-respect, my dignity, my identity. I lost everything in my life at five years old. But over the years, I've learned how to turn nothing into something. And that's why we're here today, brother. Dude, you, you have me so fired up right now, Derek. <laughs> Holy crap, man. I am, uh, what a powerful way to start this podcast. Oh, I'm, I'm uh, fighting back some tears here too, brother, man. That's a, that is a, a very strong um, um, story, man. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you go through the- I can smile. People say, why you smile? You smile so much, you got this smile. I'm like, first of all, thank you to my foster parents. They got me braces because my teeth were jacked up till 18, <laughs> right? But yeah. um, I'm healed now. I'm healed. Okay. You know? So you got to feel to heal. You got to deal, feel, heal. And I, I decided to start feeling, letting my walls down and went through the process. Deal, feel, heal. Wow. So uh, you, you go through the foster care system um, during that time. Is that where you started to pick up on music or like where, where does this influence come in and, and how has that shaped the healing process since we're on the topic? Yeah. So 10 years old, my foster parents, you know, you wouldn't know this. I'm almost six foot six, but I didn't learn to run until almost seven years old. Little three-year-olds can run, right? I mean, I was kept in the club. I was just really abused and uh, never developed uh, my small and large motor skill. So at seven years old, I learned how to run. Six and a half years old, I learned to walk up and down stairs by myself. My vocabulary at six words was approximately 60 words. I'm sorry, my, my vocabulary at six years old was approximately 60 words. The average three-year-old has a vocabulary of approximately 300 words. The average six-year-old in America has a, a vocabulary of about 2,600 words. So I knew the nasty words, the cuss words, but nobody had ever invested in me. That's my whole thing here. Mm -hmm. Then I had these foster parents that started to invest in me, and I learned how to run at seven years old. I learned how to read and write basically at eight, nine years old. And then at 10 years old, they were like, this kid is a sponge. It's just that nobody had ever invested in me, right? And so they said, we're going to have them have a creative outlet. I had physical outlet, which was soccer, but they wanted me to have a creative outlet, which was music. So they chose the clarinet for me, this 10 year old <laughs> okay. learning to play the clarinet. Right. And so my fingers were so weird because I had these small and large motor skill problems. They tried to get me on piano for at least a year, but I sucked because I could not, the motion just wouldn't work. So they chose the clarinet. And I started working on the clarinet and my foster dad 
uh, made me wake up every morning from six to seven in the morning, practice my clarinet from seven to seven thirty, work on memorization skills with them, another half an hour after school. That's two hours a day wow. playing the clarinet. Plus band lessons, private lessons, symphonic lessons. By the time I'm 12 years old, I'm a prodigy clarinet player, which means that at 12, 13, 14 years old, I'm competing at Cal State Universities in California against university students and winning because I had uh, memorized eight to 10 page concertos at 12 years old, 13 years old. And so that's where the music started. That, that, that clarinet became my, I call it my licorice stick, my little black licorice stick, right? And it became my best friend. And that's how I got like people to uh, clap for me to get good attention. And I could be in front of several hundred people at 12, 13 years old, which would then build my confidence to be in front of people, which is what is, what's the worst fear people have being in front of people speaking. Right. Right? They'd rather die. They'd rather die. They'd rather die for <laughs> sure. I've seen those stats before. It's like yeah. 60% of people or something like that. <laughs> it's They'd crazy. rather die at that moment, even speaking in front of 10 people. So here I'm 12 years old and I'm now got my best friend, this licorice stick. And I just, I love the attention that I get from the music. Wow. And so, um, so transfer that now, I'm now 16 years old. I go to a school called Hayward High, which is right outside Oakland, California. You can YouTube my high school, Hayward High riots, Hayward High fights, Hayward High gangs. You'll see my high school, a lot of African-American, Hispanic, Samoan, Tongue, Philip. It's a very cultural melting pot. And I am 16 years old and my sister has just been shot and killed. And because of a domestic situation, I'm angry at the world. I have not seen my biological mom for 10 years. I haven't seen my sister. I haven't seen anybody. And so I'm just in this foster home, right? And so I remember hanging out with my best friend, Arlen Green, African-American kid, and we're on the schoolyard and I see something over in the corner, like a big circle of people going, hoo, 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 hoo. and I'm like, dude, there's a fight over there. Cause I love to fight. I've been, I've loved to fight even sure. as an adult. I mean, I did all this martial arts and stuff and I see that you did jujitsu. You do. Jiu I do. Yeah, absolutely. I did uh, Shoshu. Uh, Kung Fu and then Taekwondo, okay. but uh, Jiu Jitsu is where it's really at. Sorry to go sidetrack, but every no, good, man. The tall guy, right? We're, the fights are always going to go to the ground and I'm going to suck on the ground. I mean, I know <laughs> how to do a few things, right? To submit them because of Jiu Jitsu, but I see you're the Jiu Jitsu master. Great. Probably, right? <laughs> Definitely Crazy. not, but yeah, on my, on my journey for sure. Oh, okay, cool. That. And so um, I thought, I think it's this fight. And then my friend goes, nah, dude, it's battles. And I'm all, what's battles? He goes, rap. And I'm like, Psh, rap, crap. I don't listen to rap. I listen to skater, death, punk, crazy music. Because at that point, I was a punk skater. I had horns. I had a weird crown on my head, shaved in the center. It like, you know, I was a skater. And I said to him, dude, come with me. And I walk over there and I see something that changes my life forever. I see two guys battling each other. They're not fighting with their fists. They're lyrically fighting with their mouth, right? And they're talking about their moms. They're cussing. They're going crazy at each other. And I turn to Arlen. I go, dude, I want to be a rapper. He goes, nah, D, you got no, you got no rhythm. You got no rhythm. I go, I want to be a rapper. Nah, D, you white. You can't do that. And I'm like, oh, man, he's seen me at high school dances. I got no rhythm, right? And, <laughs> but I knew, with, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, I wanted to be a rapper because I got so much rage, so much bitterness, so much anger, uh, hatred that my fists are always getting me in trouble. But what if I could use my mouth as a weapon, right. right? And so I said, hey, let me battle somebody. Let me battle somebody. And they called me C-Dub back then, which was CWB, short for C-Dub, which means crazy white boy. Okay. And then um, I was always in fights and just having issues. And they go, okay, you, you want to battle somebody? And they bring this guy down and he goes on me first. He's going after me. Talking about my mom, talking about my race, talking about he's cussing at me, talking about the things he's going to do with my girlfriend later on. Like, he's yeah. just like going at me. And I turn to Arlen and I go, dude, this guy is so cool. And Arlen look, says, look hard, dude, look hard. Because when you're in a battle, yeah, it's not complimentary. Like your hair is cool or you got a cool shirt or anything. Oh, sure. it's, we called it back then clowning. Like we insulted you. We tore you down. And it was my turn. And I step up. And I cuss 
and I didn't find a cool word to rhyme with the cuss word. And I sucked after about three seconds, I knew I sucked and see everybody's clowning on me and they go, CCW suck. I go, don't call me CW, call me um, Rip and D. Rip and D. And people are like, Rip and D, man, Rip and D you whack. Rip and D you whack. And I didn't care. I believed I was the goat, greatest of all time. Goat, right? right? right, right. Obviously, I had some mental health issues back then. No, you got the 16 year old <laughs> blinders on, man. You got you to gotta, totally. you live that life. And I was totally feeling that. Uh, that cloak of invincibility, like I got street, I'm street, I got street credibility, I'm a rapper right now. And right. so, but I sucked. And Rip and D was whack. The girls would say Rip and D is whack. The guys everywhere I go down A hall, B hall, C hall at high school, what's up, Rip and D? You know you whack. And I just didn't care because what is rap? Poetry, emotion, flowetry, right. right? Rap was the taxi to my spirit, rap was the master key to the lock of my mental prison. Mm -hmm. What rap allowed me to do, it was my creative voice to get the inside crap out, to get the inside pain out. So what did I do? I started writing, writing all the pain of my life, just getting it out, learn syllable arrangement, learning rhythm, learning syncopation. And I would come, I would try to battle still. Rip and D was coming up. I was trying, but no, Rip and D wasn't good. And I would just write and write and write. And then my friend gave me a reggae mixtape. A mixtape, not a CD. Okay. <laughs> That's how old I am. I'm from the old school. And he gave me a reggae mixtape, Peter Tosh, Yellow Man, Lucky Dube, Bob and Ziggy Marley. And oh, I started wow. listening to this reggae and I started vibing out to this reggae. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love it. What if I can mix reggae with rap? Yeah. That would flip everybody's script. That would flip the script. That would trip everybody out. So in one of my battles, I did something like this. I'll be there thinking, of, and people are like, what'd you just do there? And I realized I had a gift from the clarinet. Anybody knows about playing the clarinet or the, the uh, saxophone or the oboe knows about staccatos, the tongue hitting the reed. Oh, sure, yeah. I can do that forever, right? And then I thought, oh my gosh, my tongue moves quick. What if I could do tongue twisting? What if I could do like triplets or what they call ragamuffin, stutter and ragamuffin type of stuff. So then in one of my battles, I learned I had this gift. So I started working on it. And then I had the voice too, that just worked with the whole reggae transformation. So then in one of my battles, Rip and D was coming up. I went something like this. Will I be the ripping? I'm thinking I'm making, taking my time. I'll be the ripping. I think I'm making, I'm making, I'm making, I'm kicking it with the rhyme. And then I switch a reggae. Is a man no one to feel? Thinking I'm making, I'm making, I'm making, I'm kicking it, kicking it with the deals. I'm going to both feel like I'm a nothing is impossible. Okay. And then everything changed. And those girls were like, that white boy is fine. <laughs> and everything changed. And that is the birth of oh. rapping dad right there, 16 oh. years old. Wow, man. Hey, you know, I, uh, I thoughtfully having you coming on one, that's an incredible, uh, story there. Thank and, you. And two, uh, you probably can't see it, but I, I changed the albums out for every one of these, oh. uh, uh, podcasts. And yeah. the one that I'm featuring for you right now, uh, is uh, Zion, I and the grouch heroes oh. healing a nation. And it is definitely one of those good, like rap, yeah. reggae feels. It's an like awesome <laughs> confluence of, of positivity. Awesome. Um, and dude, I love where you're coming from with yeah. that. So you're, you're, you're in it, you're working on it. You're, you're not listening to any kind of naysaying. You're just right. like, this is, this is how I'm expressing it's, myself right now. And, and I'm just going to drive it voice. forward. That yeah, was the key. It gave me a voice because I had all this inside stuff I couldn't get out. And yeah. then shortly after that, my brother was killed and my good friend was shot and killed. So I had three deaths in my life between 16 and 17 years old. So I was just an out of control, angry youth in foster care. So rap kind of helped me balance a little bit, you know, to get my pain out. Okay. So then uh, you, you finish up your stint in high school, assuming that you, did you graduate through high school or? I got expelled out of high school my senior year. Okay. Um, but then the, the county foster care system and the superintendent worked it out where I could come back to school and I would just have to spend the last two periods in the assistant principal's office until, uh, I, I did graduate. Uh, okay. I wasn't going to graduate at all, but I did enough to graduate. And I remember my guidance counselor says, Oh my gosh, you're going to graduate. Cause she had warned me three months ahead. I wasn't going to graduate. And 
I'm the first one in my family to graduate high school. I'm the first one to realize it's not about your IQ, it's about your I will. It's not about how much smart you have, it's about how much heart you have. Right. And if you can put your mind to something, see my favorite word is tenacity, persistent determination. And once you put your mind to something, man, if you put your mind on there and you've got that mental toughness, nothing can hold you back. And that's what I'm all about, that tenacity. Dude, so you, so then, man, you just keep firing me up right uh -oh. now. <laughs> so, so you get out of high school and then what, like, what, what is this journey like, man? How, how do you, how do you get to the point where you've written seven books yeah. and that you're traveling the, the world yeah. speaking? Like what, what was the, you're still the caterpillar at this point. Yeah. Like what makes the butterfly? So I went to college for a little bit because my foster parents, when you turn 18 in foster care, the checks stop coming to the foster parents. So generally you leave and you just couch surf or you sleep on the street. You're homeless. I don't know if you know this, Jake, but California, I'm from California. 74% of the male prison inmates have been in foster care. I didn't know that at yeah, all. In that Texas, 80% of the Texas death row inmates have been in foster care. 65% of the sex trafficking in America are from young boys and girls in foster care. And 51% of the U.S. homeless population are former fosters, foster from wow. foster care. So the statistics aren't good for me. I should be an addict, homeless, incarcerated, or dead. Yeah. Remember what I said earlier. Once you have that tenacity, nothing right. can stop you. You can learn to turn nothing into something, right? Right. And so I went to college for a little bit because my foster parents said, if you go to college, you can live here. So I learned how to work the system there and go night school and then, you know, uh, uh, have a job. But I got a job at 23 years old in the mortgage industry. And I started flowing there, like doing good. And then and then I got my real estate license, California real estate license. I think it was 25. And then I opened up my own company at 30, 30 years old and then made my first million at 31. And so I didn't have a mentor, which I, my learning curve was really bad. <laughs> if you have a mentor, then it will help you tremendously. Right. And so right. our coach or something. So I had this staff. What I did, I'm not a very smart person. All I did was hire smarter people than me. If you're the smartest person in your circle, you need to get out. You should have at least three friends who are smarter than yeah. you that help elevate you, right? That's the key. Your network determines your net worth. <laughs> right. So having the right people in your circle, right? And so um, I, I did very well uh, because of this, this mindset. It's not about my IQ. It's about my I will. And then... I did very well for a number of years, had uh, a few offices, lots of employees doing very well, all the toys that you would want. When the Hummers came out, I had to get the Hummer, you know, the rappers had the Hummer, you know, right. like I spent a lot of money on a Hummer and da, 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 all the, I had all the toys. And 2008 comes along, 2008, the greatest recession the America, American people have ever seen. Oh yeah. I lost my businesses. I had to sell all my toys. I barely kept my home and life was difficult. I went from having lots and lots of money to having almost no money. And it was very humbling. And here's where the transformation happened, the caterpillar. Cause you would think the caterpillar would have been when I was successful in the world standards, successful by financial. I had all that, but now to me, Success is significance. What am I doing to contribute to this world? Success is not financial to me anymore. I've learned very valuable lessons. Some of the happiest people I know, the happiest people I know make thirty, forty thousand dollars a year, love going fishing. They get their one week or two week vacation and money only magnifies who you are. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. If you're not happy, there's lots of wealthy people that are not happy. I meet them. There's lots of celebrities that make lots of millions, millions, millions of dollars that are not happy. And so money and fame only magnify who you are within. And so I lo I'm losing everything, Jake. And I still had a little money in my Sephira. I mean, I had a good sum before I lost it in the stock market stuff, but I had, I was able to call my financial planner 
<laughs> and tell him that I need some money for two years. He goes, what? You're, you're only 40, 40 years old or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, uh, or 38 years old. And I'm like, yeah, I need money now. And he goes, Derek, if you take the money out, you're going to get penalized. And I go, dude, I don't even know if I'm going to be alive at 65. Right. I need the money now. And do you know, it was a big deal. Yeah. I took the money out and I decided to find myself. And I got a copy of all my county records from Alameda County, Oakland, California, foster care records. Nobody had really known that I was in foster care. That was not my image. That was not my story. I, my story was I was a multimillionaire with all the toys and look at me, look at me, look at me. And I got to tell you, one of the greatest investments that I've ever made and I've made money on stock market and other things, houses, all this stuff. But one of the greatest investments, Jake's, I, I've ever made is liquidating that SEP IRA and investing in myself and writing my first book called I Will Never Give Up, which is the flesh of some of the, the records of like psychiatric evaluations, psychological exams, neurological evaluations, foster care records. And that book started to take off. And then people were like, will you speak? Will you speak? And I'm like, no, I don't want to speak about my life. I just wanted to write a book. Well, we'll pay you. And I'm like, what? And, okay. you know, it's a recession, right? And I'm like, you'll pay me? Yeah, we'll pay you. We'll pay you $1,000. What? For 45 minutes. I'm like, oh my gosh, you'll pay me? Okay, but can I do like a little rap or bring my guitar on stage? You go, oh my gosh, that sounds good. So then I, that was my little formula for the first few years was doing, bringing my guitar and rapping with my guitar and all that stuff. That's before Ed Sheeran, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so, there you go. <laughs> and so as I started to help people, the armor came off of my heart mm. and I started to become vulnerable and I became my authentic self. People say, oh, you reinvented yourself during this re re recession. I said, no. I just became myself, my authentic, true self. And then uh, all of a sudden I'm getting speaking event after speaking event. And then the fee goes way up, right. you know, cause it's supply and demand if you know business, right. And all of a sudden I'm making a lot of money per speaking event. And I'm at a speaking event and I'm just rapping for them. And I decide, well, I'll just do that for my kids in the car. So I get in the car and I rap in the car with my kids. And my son catches it on camera, on video, on the phone. And we put it on YouTube and it has like a thousand views. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm famous. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a few years ago, right? Like, oh my gosh, a thousand views. That's unbelievable. That's, that's, that's crazy. That's awesome. And then it sat for six months. It sat. Six months later, it hits Reddit. And then Shaquille O'Neal sends a tweet out, what's up, MC Soccer Dad? And then I'm on World Star Hip Hop. And then I'm on <laughs> all these things. Like, it just went viral. Sure. It just went absolutely nuts. And then somebody says, you better monetize your video real quick because you just went viral. So then I monetized my YouTube video. And then I started Facebook and all this stuff. Right. And it just went. And that was the first video. It, it probably had like uh, 25 million views. And so then I thought, well, I got an audience. I got, you know, a couple hundred thousand people following me now. And so then I started putting out videos yeah. and people were resonating with them. And people were just like, oh my gosh, I love your relationship with your kids. I love, you know, how you are. You're a fun person. I'm a fun dad. Um, and so I put this out and all of a sudden, like two years, it was about two years ago, I put out a, a video where I'm rapping in the car with my little 11 year old daughter and my eight year old son. And the whole premise behind this rap was, it was just caught off guard. It was not really rehearsed or anything. I mean, it, I mean, I had the words memorized and such like that, but I got in the car and my daughter, here's this song on the radio by Nicki Minaj. And I'm like, Ooh, turn that off. That is not appropriate for 11 year old daughter. Sure. She goes, dad, I love that song. They play at the studio. I'm like, no, it's not appropriate. So then I do something like this, Jake. I go, got to keep the lyrics clean. If you know what I mean. 
No more Nicki Minaj and her twerking machine. No more naked fashion from Kim Kardashian. You a mom. Do you need an intervention? And Miley, no more wrecking ball. Put on some clothes. Where's Hannah, y'all? <laughs> And because she loved little Hannah Montana. Yeah, Hannah Montana, right? yeah. That's yeah, cool. and then she's like, who's naked Miley, right? Because Miley yeah. Cyrus is naked in that video. Got to turn off Kanye. Eminem, Jay-Z, no more cuss words and negativity because a lot of rappers talk about drug sex killing. But when they're going to use their words to start healing, infect the mind of our young kids. When I think about the little boy who didn't know Jesus, but knew Lil Wayne, knew T-Pain, knew 2 chains 50, LeBron James. This is insane in the membrane because I'm ripping, I'm thinking I'm making, giving back the game, man. Everybody's got a little battle to battle. I'm the rapping dad, gotta get you back in the saddle. Ripping the thinking I'm making, sucking I'm making, the kick it kind of famous. Here I am now making up my own language. You talking Illuminati, talking about your Maserati or your hottie, hottie, hottie in the back of your Degati, man. What's the real rap? Not bubblegum pop. I'm from the old school of conscious hip hop. <laughs> and wow. then that went viral sure. that particular rap right there went viral and that's like 250 million views been shared by snoop dogg i mean t-pain uh ti like yeah. all these big celebrities have shared these videos and it just went crazy and then i'm on steve harvey's tv show and tv shows all over the world so it's pretty yeah, incredible. You've been on CNN. You've been on Steve Harvey. You've been I've, been on, I've been on all the major newer networks. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that, I mean, the message that's, that's in there as well. So I, you know, I'm, I consider myself a fun dad too. Yeah. Uh, and I, in high school, I mean, I got my yearbooks, anybody still dotting in Alaska, you look it up, you know, I was in the rap off, you know, oh. Maddock was my rap name <laughs> back in the day. Jay Maddock! Jay Maddock, 14, 15 years old. Uh, my, my good buddy, Joe uh, Smith at the time, you know, he, him and I would get together when we would write. And I think uh. I, 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 you know, I'm so interested in your story because I think very similarly appreciation for hip hop appreciation for rap music, also an outlet for me to kind of explore words right. and feelings and things uh, at the time. I ended up taking a different path, uh, whereas I went down the heavy metal music oh, to yeah. continue exploring that expression. Um, but, you know, I, I listen to a lot of rap music as it is today, and I do hear um, what you're saying. It's, it's, it's overly, you know, 90% or more. Yeah. Not, not necessarily negative, but it's, you know, the, the values Percocet. are questionable. It's, yeah. it's kind of painful sometimes to listen to. Percocet, Percocet, Molly, Molly, you know, it's all about prescription drugs and all this yeah. stuff. And I have such a great appreciation for the sound of it. Yeah. Right. And great like, it, it, it kind of gets you going. But like, when you break down, like what you're saying, it's like, yeah. man, that's, it's tough. You know, I, I know my kids end up hearing it, you know, we might be on somebody's boat at the lake or something yeah. like that. And you hear certain words and you're like, man, there, there's only so many years uh, until they understand what that means. Right. And you know, that's being elevated. Right. Um, and so here you are uh, kind of, you know, using the same art form, but expressing positivity through it. So you yeah. have that rap, it blows up. And then I believe you've done a lot more. Yeah, I got a lot of raps out there. But you know, I'm not into rap these days. I'm into the beats. Okay. Like I got a producer just sent me another beat. It's like a Drake beat, you know, it's really cool. So I might be doing something with that. But um, I'm not into the rap these days. I'm still stuck in the 90s and the 80s, early 80s, 90s, right? EPMD, Tupac, oh, sure. KRS One, MC Light, Public Enemy, MC Search, you okay. know, MC Shy D, Two Live Crew, Two Short, E40, you know, like all these. <laughs> back, I used to record out of the same studio with some of those guys, so it's pretty awesome. Yeah. But when I was writing raps back in those days, even to this day, I mean, I still throw out raps about real life. And then when Eminem came out, you know, I'm like, that's me, that's me, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, I didn't know Dr. Dre, but he knew, Dr. you know, he was able to, and he's pretty good. But I, I want to share with you a rap that I wrote when I was, what, 17. Okay. I took out all the cuss words because I have kids now. <laughs> well, let's do it, my friend. You, I mean, you've been flowing and going since we started. So like, let's keep riding it. Yeah, so this is what I'm all about in rap. It's all, you know, rap used to be all about the struggle, about the story. And that's what made Tupac great. That's what made NWA great. You know, a lot of these old school rappers was all about the story. So I wrote a rap when I was 17 about my story. And it goes like this. And I, I keep it clean now for audiences, but it used to have a lot of filler words in there. So, um, cause a lot of angst came out of it, but it goes, who's going to win and who's going to lose. I never thought I'd be wearing these shoes of life. 
Man, it don't feel right. When am I going to see the light and feel the light? Walk with me. Someone walk with me. Come on, dad. Yeah, just talk to me. Have you ever thought about me in your life? Why'd you want to kill me and take away my life? I'm your blood dad. I'm your son dad. Yeah, it's messed up knowing that I never knew my dad. Who didn't want to be a dad? What's up with that? Don't understand. But yo, I got to move past. Hey, daddy, daddy. Hey, where you been? In the jail cell. Yeah, once again. You ain't never seen me smile. Never seen me walk. Never seen me talk, never, never seen me rock this microphone, yeah. This is my home, let me out of my pain because I know I'm not alone, yeah. These are my peeps and I'm telling how I feel. This is no secret and I'm keeping it real now, mama. Why'd you have to run away? Why'd you leave me alone? Why'd you have to make me pay for my daddy's sins and daddy's eyes and daddy's pain and daddy's lies? Now I'm on the outside, yeah, looking inside. I'm gonna bust this curse even if I gotta die. Everyone loses something sometime. I never thought I'd have to lose my mind and lose my world and lose my soul and lose the ones who really gave me hope. Now my sister's been killed and my brother's been killed and my friend's been killed. When am I gonna heal? In the snap of a finger when my life gets jacked in my brain, I'm thinking I'm making it start to feel trapped where the love was, yeah, hate begins. Now I'm mad at the world cause the pain won't end. I'll cover up the hurt. I cover up the shame. I'm caught in the middle of a hurricane of pain. So pain, pain, show me what you got. Now I'm never gonna let anyone back in my heart till my wrists start to bleed. And I don't feel the need of living this life. Will someone help me? Man, I need you. Say a prayer for me. Yeah, let me believe that you believe in me. Yeah, let me believe that you believe in me. Let me believe that you Belief in me. Oh, I kind of slammed it out, slam poetry there, but yeah. Yeah, man. Oh. This is, that's that. That was you got that me speechless old. for a minute. That's a, yeah. that's got a lot of weight to it, especially in the context of the story you just yeah. shared, right? That's the birth of rapping dad right there. And I used to write the dark stuff, man, and people would be like, "Holy cow, you got some dark stuff, D." But I had a lot of pain. Now I'll just, now Jake, let me, let me flip the script here. Yeah. Now we're going to bring you back up. Okay. Now I'll do something like check a mic one, two, three, four. Here I am rapping dad going to give you more because I'm ripping. I'm thinking I'm making, taking my time. I never walk into a party with a comatose rhyme because I'm not tech nine, not Busta Rhymes. Take it to the minute. Take it to the limit with the BC boy line. No sleep till Brooklyn. That's the deal. And I'm galactic license to ill. Old school, man, we popping and ticking. Keep a finger licking when I barbecue chicken on a rap God mission with an Eminem vision. And I take it to the max and I'm getting his attention. And I'm always dropping wisdom and you got to pay attention as I'm rocking on the microphone, even for the prisons. No need to pop off. It's time to chill. Here I come with a little reggae rag. I'm up a feel. It's a man who was a villa. Bongy coming up strong. Ripping a second to make it a second to make it a kick in another rapping dad song. There, you know, see how music just elevates oh, you and takes you down. That's crazy, man. Back up. You, you, you're for real, man. You you got the <laughs> rhymes. You I, like you you're getting after it. Damn. <laughs> Dude. But yeah, no, my life has been a roller coaster. Like I just took you on this roller coaster. Yeah. Now we're up. Yeah. So um I'm I, I want to go back just a little bit, if you yeah. don't mind, in, into those two years. Um, because it's those two years that you took off and you're looking back into your life, um, did you, did you end up reaching out to people at that time? Is that like the sort of journey that you went in for healing? Like you got your records and then like, you really wanted to put your story together so that you could, so that you could understand a current state and then like kind of be done with it or identify with it moving forward. I, you know, I don't know. It's just like what happened in those two years. Yeah. So I started meeting family members and such and, uh, a biological family, but I realized that something that I've kept hidden, uh, foster care, the whole story, man, really helped people because people can uh, uh, resonate with death, with abandonment, with rejection, with abuse, right? And so I had gone through all those things. Even when I speak to gangbangers in prison or on probation at juvie and such, they, you know, here on this Gavacho, Gavacho, right? This the gringo, this white boy, and it could be all African American, it could be all Hispanic, but they resonate to the story. And it, the truth is that we all have a story. And I learned to divorce my story from victim to victor, right? Right. And I wanted to, as I started to fill other people up with hope. 
it started filling me up. So I call myself a hope dealer. I know that might sound a little cheesy, nope. but hope dealer, right? Not a hate dealer, not a dream stealer, not a dope dealer, a hope dealer. And when I gave my TED talk on the power of determination, I came up with an acronym in there for hope, helping one person every day, hope. When it becomes more than helping one person every day, then hope becomes helping other people excel. And I just started to adopt that I'm a hope dealer, that I'm out there sharing a message of hope, sharing a message of redemption, sharing a message of resilience. And during those two years, I started to see that my story could help other people. Yeah. How did all of our ancestors learn? It doesn't matter what your cultural background is, what religion, what anything is about you. All of our ancestors didn't learn on, didn't learn on Facebook. So, yeah, it's they learned through stories from our elders, yeah. right? So it was passed down. But somewhere along the way, we've been taught as men not to be vulnerable. We've been taught don't get emotional. We've been taught be strong. Well, the strongest I know get emotional. The strongest I know are vulnerable because it makes you real. It makes you raw. It makes you present in this moment. And everybody has a story. And this is for all you listeners right now because you have a story. Every one of you has a story. But remember this, your story could be the key, could be the key that unlocks someone else's mental prison. Your story, your vulnerability could empower someone else with hope. And when I realized the power of hope the power of storytelling, oh my gosh, it just filled me. And then I, I got the bug. The caterpillar came out at that point was like, I know my mission in life. I know my purpose yeah. in life. And here's the fact. The meaning of life, Jake, is to give your life meaning. Let me say that again. The meaning of life is to give your life meaning. The secret of living is giving. What are you doing to contribute to this world? So That's how the caterpillar rose. Oh, man. So we, so here we are, um, two things. One, COVID-19, lockdown, trying times. People are having a lot of time to spend with themselves, maybe spending around uh, people that uh, maybe are not beneficial to their mental health. I've seen a lot of statistics of uh, kind of rising domestic abuse, rising uh, mental health issues. That's kind of going across child the abuse. country. Yeah, Child, child abuse, abuse for sure. Um, so um, as far as um, your perspective on that and what people can do um, to, to start the healing process, do, would you offer any advice of like maybe where to get started or, or maybe what, how, do you, how to plant that like first seed in, in getting on a path to healing? Right. Okay. So number one, COVID is hard. We've all been on some kind of lockdown. Our lives have been changed and it's just hard. And the strongest people I know have had rough times during this. I've had some rough times. And you got to just go back to your mental mindset. And what I do is I watch documentaries. I see other people struggling. I see their, their message of redemption. That fills me up. So if you're just doing Netflix and just watching sad or horror or all these things that don't actually fill you, they're numbing you, they're making you zone out, you need to stop that for a little while. Get rid of your phone for an hour or two hours a day. Don't touch it. The normal person is touching it over a hundred times a day. Don't touch it. Silence yourself and focus on how do I build my inner fitness, my inner muscles, my patience muscle, my determination muscle, my courage muscle, my integrity muscle, my persistence muscle, my creativity muscle. All these muscles need to be worked on so that you can get the inner world together so your outside world can be much better because there is story after story in documentary of people that have come from brutal situations, prisoners of war, people in African countries, people just people in Europe, people, uh, you know, people that have gone through so much to get to America or are living in hell, but they're still laughing. And they don't have your TV. They don't have your Netflix. They don't have your nice house. And if you get to realization, like, oh my gosh, I'm so blessed, number one, to live in this country because there's billions of people that don't have running water, electricity. And you look at that around the world and you go, my gosh, they're playing soccer with a bunch of duct tape, you oh, know, rolled and rolled. And they're not even playing soccer with a soccer Barefoot. ball and they're happy. And they're, so you have to look at it like that. And I know I go up and down sometimes. It's human nature, you know, but you got to go back to the gratitude. And what, what helps me is documentaries, listening to great podcasts, uh, filling my mind up with like, oh my gosh, 
okay, humble yourself. Right. Just be humble. Be kind. The world doesn't revolve around you. Sometimes we feel like it does. It does. You know, like the world, our world's crashing. My world is crashed so much time so many times as a kid and an adult but i have to go back to what brought me where i am my mental mindset number one my faith and filling my head with the right things right and then reaching out that's another thing people are afraid to re reach out because they're uh, uh they're afraid of their vulnerability no reach out it's better than that than i mean how many people i've had to deal with that have attempted to commit suicide or have committed suicide no, reach out, reach out to me, reach out to you. You know, I mean, if you reach out to me, I'm, it's going to take me a long time to get back to you because I got a lot of followers, but I mean, I will eventually, but reach out to somebody in your inner circle or find a right. new inner circle or find a church or a club or a, uh, find the scriptures, ancient texts, whatever religion, I don't know, something that's going to fill you. So podcasts do it for me a lot. Oh, for that's sure. I'm excited to be on your podcast. Well, man, I, I tell you what, you know, I, I started this podcast to interview interesting people with positive, motivating stories. And I, I, you've just exemplified exactly what that is. Your, your journey has, it's, I'm going to be listening to this over and over again. You've said so many powerful, insightful things. Uh, and I hope that folks who are listening uh, will find that same value uh, out of listening uh, to this as well. I got to be straight with you too, Jake. Sometimes when I'm having a hard time, because everyone, no one's, yeah. immune, no one's invincible. We all have hard times. Sometimes a video of me will pop up on Facebook or Instagram. Or something will come up and I'll watch it. I'm like, oh my gosh, follow your own wisdom, Derek. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right. And we have Stop to follow a pity our party. Stop having a pity party. Uh, and, you, and you know, you talked a lot about unlocking things, right? right? And sometimes you don't realize that the box is locked again. Yeah. And, then, the, and then you've got to like, oh, here's this perspective. Here's this yeah. mindset that I've had for a long time. Right. And for some reason, I just didn't look behind me to see that it wasn't following closely like it used to be. And now it's, yeah. now no, I got to totally. come back and get it and unlock it. And here it is. Like, I'm that person again. All right. Right. Yeah, no, totally. And you look at some of these big pastors, they've had hard times. They'll tell you even recently, yeah. right? Uh, even like Tony Robbins, the godfather of like this motivation now, right? You know, you talk to his sons and such and yeah, my dad would get mad. My dad would uh, get sad and stuff like that. So it, it happens. We're human. Human right. has all human nature has all these emotions, and you just have to remember you're not your thoughts. Research has shown thirty five thousand thoughts go through our mind every single day, and a lot of them are negative. A lot of them, and so you have to be the gatekeeper of your thoughts. And you know, bad thoughts out, good thoughts in, and it's tough. But literally, it's you're one thought away from a new thought. But it's just controlling your mind and controlling having your subconscious and your conscious sink and controlling it, right? And then sinking your mind to your heart. I call it sinking your spirit. And so once you sink everything together, you're back on track again. But we all get unsynced. All of us get unsynced. Everyone has a bad day. Everyone. Your favorite president of the United States, your favorite pastor, your favorite teacher, your favorite mom or dad, your uncle, your grand. Everybody's had bad days. Absolutely. So 2020 is crazy times right now. <laughs> yeah, so. Maybe a majority of bad days for a lot of people. Yeah, too. totally. So, hey, what, what are you up to now? So, like, now that we're starting re-entry or the new next or kind of what yeah. people are kind of calling this period of time, this, this purgatory between, yeah. <laughs> you know, lockdown and, um, you know, the way things used to be uh, prior to March. What's Derek up to? What can we expect? And then, you know, shout out your, your socials and your, oh, okay, your yeah. websites and all that stuff as well. Let's see. I'm heading off to Texas next week to do a live event. The first one in like, what, seven months. Wow. So I'm excited about that in Texas, in the middle of Texas. Um, I've got uh, some new music coming out. And, you know, to be honest with you, uh, working on re new website development, all this other stuff that is going along with that. Uh, and then I'm just going to take a break. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, come November, uh, generally November through January, I kind of just take a break and I just work on new material and I, I fill my head with new stuff. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but right over there, right there, right there yeah. is six courses from Princeton, UCSF, and Washington State University on the brain. So I've got all these courses that I'm going to study about the brain this winter. 
that's that's awesome. That's what time to do. So you're you're so unpacking kind of you're getting closer to the neuroscience side of things. Yeah, just totally. In- I, I want to get more into why we think what we think, why we believe what we believe, the chemical releases. So yeah, what releases the chemical. So I've got a lot of stuff that I'm gonna learn this um this winter. And you know, I'm always trying to grow, always yeah. trying to learn. So I've read so many motivational books, so many this and that, but no, I want to get into here, man. Why do people do what they do? So, um, and then my rapping handles or my social media handles are rapping dad, R A P P I N G D A D on Instagram, on Facebook, YouTube, rapping dad. My website is I will never give up.com. I will never give up.com. Make it personal. And I'll close on a wrap. Let's do it, man. I, uh, I'm honored to have had you for a guest, man. Let's, let's, let's close it out right. I'll close it out on something that will give you some wisdom, right? Turn All a right. mess into a message, right? Here we go. All right, here we go. So here's a few lessons that I've learned. I've turned a mess into a message and earned a return. I've turned scars into stars. Live like avatars. No one can stop you if you believe in your heart. And this is your life. Go and own it. Never let the past infect your future for a moment. Never let a weakness destroy your greatness. It's time to profess. You're too blessed to be stressed. Bam, you can be everything you want to be. But never let the enemy mm, be an enemy. It's time to be better and not bitter. It's a choice to be a winner, and it's a choice to be a quitter. So if you've been knocked down or thought about suicide, get out of the shadows and hold your head high, because this is your time. And this is your sign. Get up and climb. You were born for this moment to shine. I'm Derek Clark. Thank you, Jake, for having me out. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. I'm looking forward to getting together next time. Sounds good, man. Cheers. Take care.